You won't read the transfiguration the same after watching this video. Despite only being contained in a handful of verses, this might be one of the most pivotal moments in all of Jesus' ministry. Today, I'll tell you the secrets behind every detail in the story, from the cloud on the mountain, to the words uttered by Peter, to the real unwritten purpose behind Jesus' transformation. I surveyed various Bible translations, commentaries, articles, and sermons to present to you a full picture of Jesus' transfiguration, recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, where I'm certain you'll learn something you didn't already know. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. And if you're on Discord, join us over there too. We've only been running for a few days and already have regular prayer groups, Bible debates, and topics of the day. Link will be in the description. Let's start by locating the passage in our Bibles. It appears in each of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I decided to read the verses prior to the Transfiguration in each account to get a bit of context, and this is what I found. Matthew 16 opens with the Jewish leaders demanding a sign from heaven. Bit ironic considering that's exactly what the Transfiguration would go on to be. Peter proves his faith by declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, which gives him some brownie points, but he immediately loses them when Jesus rebukes him and calls him Satan in the following verses. Jesus then challenges his disciples to take up their cross and follow him. But what's most interesting to me is the last line in Luke and Matthew. Some who are standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This verse has a few interpretations, but it's actually about to be fulfilled in the very next title, The Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Luke's account said that Jesus led his disciples up a mountain to pray together. But in typical disciple fashion, they fall asleep. It says that when they finally awoke, they saw his glory. JC Ryle says this passage ought to always be read with thankfulness as we get a precious glimpse into the second coming of Christ. Think of it like two forms of a video game character. The first was humble and lowly, the second will be grand and bright. In this story, we get a tiny peek into Jesus' second form, his glorious spiritual form, which was meant to encourage and strengthen the Lord's disciples. In fact, the three that were selected were not chosen at random. Bearing witness to this event gave them qualification to carry out the role given them by God. Peter leading the early church, James being killed for his faith by Herod, and John encountering Jesus again in the book of Revelation and outliving all the other apostles. This event helped to prepare the apostles for Jesus' passion, which all three were a part of, making the witnesses to two huge events, his transfiguration and his death and resurrection, giving their future evangelism credibility. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So at this point, the sleepyheads finally wake up and see Jesus standing there with two other guys. Luke's Gospel says they appeared in glorious splendor, which implies they've got resurrected and glorified bodies. Moses here is representing the law, and Elijah is representing the prophets. Combined, they represent the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant between God and man. Interestingly enough, it's believed that the bodies of Elijah and Moses were physically present with Jesus on the mountain. Now, that's not an issue for Elijah, since we know his body was taken up to heaven by God, and technically didn't die. But Moses we know died and was buried. However, he was buried in Moab by God himself, and no human was made aware of the location of his bones. So it's possible God tucked him away and brought him back up for this very moment. Something we totally miss though is Moses during this conversation. God says in Deuteronomy to Moses that he is going to raise up a man like Moses and all men will listen to him because he will have the words of God in his mouth. Verse 15 says that it is to him you shall listen, which is exactly what we see Moses gets to experience in this story. Moses is listening to the very guy God told him about. Peter reacts impulsively, saying, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Mark and Luke's gospel add the nice little fact that he was talking complete nonsense. I find that somewhat funny that Mark and Luke just straight up roast him for his irreverent comment, but I actually think there's meaning to be gleaned from it. We know how cynical Christians can feel about the world oftentimes. The call to suffer for Christ 
and sacrifice, to love our enemies and exercise self-control is often seen as a burden. But upon witnessing Jesus in his glorified state along with two saints with glorified bodies, Peter experienced the remedy for our cynical doubt, hope in the face of persecution and death. Since they'd already been told of Jesus' death and had been called to sacrifice themselves for the same cause, it was special for them to see their reward on full display, the glorious new bodies they would inherit through his sacrifice and their faith. The words, it is good for us to be here, will no doubt echo through every Christian's mouth on the day of his return, knowing that pain and suffering is at last vanquished and our redemption is just moments away. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Believe it or not, this cloud might actually be more significant than Peter in this story. Jokes aside, the word bright is used to describe the cloud. In these four verses, God uses a cloud to make an appearance in the Old Testament, but it's just that, a cloud. By describing the cloud as bright, the author is drawing a distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The previous cloud symbolized God's veiled glory. The bright cloud removes the veil and shows that Jesus illuminates the previously feared and mysterious deity of the Old Testament. Luke's Gospel adds that the disciples entered the cloud and were afraid, symbolizing God's desire to bring us into his presence. If the piercing white light, the appearance of Moses and Elijah, and the bright cloud cover wasn't enough to prove that Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God, the Father himself confirms it. This is the second time we hear an audible voice from the Father in the Gospels. The first, of course, being after his baptism of John. This time the disciples are told to listen to him. Peter mentions this life-changing event in his letter saying, We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. This is definitely something he did not forget. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. The sudden departure of Moses and Elijah symbolizes a clearing of the path. It's time they step aside so God himself can fulfill what was written. Isn't it beautiful how the disciples were so terrified to enter the presence of God in the cloud and overwhelmed that they fall to the ground in terror, but Jesus comes to them, touches them and says, don't be afraid. What a beautiful transitional picture of how we once interacted with God and how we now interact with God in the new covenant. Before men were terrified of his awe and mystery, now the mystery has been revealed and we're shown grace included in the bright cloud of God and welcomed into his presence, not in fear, but in boldness. This really is a treasure of a passage. We should hold our Bibles shaking with gratitude as we read it. Put yourself in Peter's shoes. You too are allowed to enter the bright cloud of God. You too are allowed to witness in awe the glorious transformation of Jesus from his first coming state to his second coming state. You too get to see Moses and Elijah in their new spiritual bodies. And if you believe in Jesus, you too will join with Peter in saying, it is good for us to be here. Let us remember in times of suffering and trouble that Jesus went before us and endured it far worse so that we could inherit the same kind of spiritual glory he and the saints of old have attained. Let us remember that it is only through his grace that we are made white like him and can approach the throne boldly. What a profound handful of verses. I wanted to upload an in-depth study like this on the channel just to see if this is something you guys like or if it's a bit too overwhelming. Give me your feedback in the comments and if you haven't already joined the Discord server, please consider joining. All glory to God for this incredible passage. Amen.